Okay, what I wanted to do today was just follow up on a video I did recently from MIT Integration B 2024, problem 14. And in that video, I mentioned another method that I didn't do in that video was that we could have just done a U substitution. Substituting here, the derivative of this is gonna be this right here. And let's just see what happens when I do it that way. So we'll set this up. So for my U, we just have X plus one over X, and then DU, derivative of this is gonna be exactly this. So it's gonna be one minus one over x squared dx. So we'll go ahead with this substitution again. This and this is our du. So this is just going to become e to the e to the u, and then everything else is du. Then I'll update the bounds. So we plug in e here. This is going to become e plus 1 over e. And then we plug in 1 over e here. It's in a different order, but this is still going to come out to e plus 1 over e. But then from here, you'll notice our lower bound is exactly the same as our upper bound. We have this principle of the definite integral that when our bounds are the same, the integral is just zero. And this is actually the same solution I got in the video, and this is the same solution that MIT has zero. But still, I almost always avoid this method. And in my mind, I usually just consider this wrong because, because the problem with this is you can actually force this scenario in a lot of cases when you do a U substitution, and then you might get zero, but it's the wrong answer. A really simple example of this might be, let's say we were integrating just like x squared dx, and we'll say like from minus three to three. If we look at the graph of this, our graph of x squared is something like this. And if we're going from minus three to three, very rough graph, we clearly have some area here, right? It's clearly something, I don't know what it is, but it's, there's clearly some positive area. But if I make a U substitution over here, I mean, not that we need it because it's just power rule, but if I made a U substitution for X squared, well then when we update our bounds here, we put in three here for the upper bound. So we get our U is nine. We put in our lower bound minus three. And again, our bound is nine. So then when we go ahead and do this substitution, we've got the same bound. So this has to be zero, but we know it can't be zero because there's clearly area under the curve. So what do we do wrong here? It seems like a legitimate substitution, even though it's unnecessary. It's like, we still can do this, right? But then we do it, we get the wrong answer. Well, the short answer is really, with this graph, it's not one-to-one. -one. In other words, if you do the horizontal line test through here, because we have a horizontal line that intersects at more than one point, it fails the horizontal line test. And so this is something to look out for with the U substitution. You also will see this problem a lot with sine and cosine is like the sine curve, right? Clearly it doesn't pass the horizontal line test because it's gonna be intersected at multiple points. But now getting back to the integral that we're working on, the question is, does this thing right here, does all of this, does this pass the horizontal line test? Well, in the other video, we did take a quick look at the graph of this and it was pretty strange. We we're only concerned with the graph between one over E and E. So like somewhere in here, let's just say, let's say this is one over E and this is E. Now the strange thing about the graph of this is at the point one, you'll notice if you plug one in here, it's zero. So we are at zero at one, but basically what it looks like, it's very close. I mean, it appears to be a vertical line, but now even though it looks like a vertical line, it's actually not, it's just a very steep increasing curve. So we could try the horizontal line test on it. And of course it just intersects at one point, right? So we might be able to say that this just passes the horizontal line test. I'm not really sure on that because it's kind of tricky where we have something where we don't, we can't really see the whole curve. So my thinking on this originally was how do we know that it really passes the horizontal line test? How do we know there isn't like a problem up at like 100,000? The horizontal line test only has to fail at one point to fail the whole thing. Now, logically, I think you can look at this and see that it's increasing for all X values within these bounds, but it's a little bit like, how do I show that? So for me, in this case, I don't think I would just trust the horizontal line test. I think I want to take a derivative of this to see that it's actually increasing at all points within these bounds. Okay, so let's take the derivative of this and we'll use the product rule. I'll make this first piece my f and this piece my g. So for the product rule, we just want to find f prime g plus f g prime. So for the first piece, f prime, that's just going to be derivative of one is zero. Derivative of this is going to be plus two over x cubed. And then we'll just copy down this other part. And then plus, we'll just want our f, one minus one over x squared. And then we need to take the derivative of this thing. So at first it's gonna be e to the e, x plus one over x. Let me get rid of this stuff. And then we'll need the chain rule on this right here. So that's gonna give me e, x plus one over x. And then we need the derivative of this, and that's just gonna be one minus one over x squared. Well, this is the same as this, so I can get rid of this and write this as squared over here. 
And now we have this term in common, so I can actually factor that out. So I'll factor e to the e x plus 1 over x in front. Then here we're just going to have 2 over x cubed. And then what's left, we'll have this piece here, 1 minus 1 over x squared squared, and then just this e x plus 1 over x. So in order to show that this is always strictly increasing or strictly decreasing, all we need is for this derivative to be always positive or always negative within these bounds. Well, for this first piece, because this is an exponential, this is clearly always going to be positive. Now, keep in mind our bounds are always positive. 1 over e is like 0 0.36. I mean, obviously, it's not a negative number. So if our bounds, everything here is positive, then this has to be positive as well when we plug into x cubed. Because this whole thing here is squared, this piece has to always be positive. And then again, base e, so this is always positive. So everything's always positive, so this whole thing has to always be greater than zero within these bounds. So therefore, this function is always increasing. I didn't need to cross this out. This is actually legit this time. We can actually call this zero. So this is the one case where it works, and we get zero, and we can do this, and we're fine. Okay, there you have it. Alternative method, MIT 2024, problem 14. Thanks everyone for watching. Have a good day.